Okay, I think uh, we can start. And um, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Yasmin Kanvil. I'm head of the Alexandria Office of the German Arab Chamber of Industry and Commerce. Uh, I'm delighted to be moderating such an interesting session. And um, I would like to thank the Digital Arabia Network for giving me such a great opportunity. And special thanks go to Ms. Martina Sibel from the Rakomeya team, who is technically supporting our uh, session today. Martina, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm sure all of you have been in so many digital conferences and uh, webinars before, uh, since it's become the norm. Uh, since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it wouldn't hurt to give you uh, quickly some housekeeping rules to have a smooth session. Um, kindly keep your mics muted and your cameras turned off. We will, and if you have any questions, please write them in the chat box. If you wish to speak, just uh, use the hand in the, uh, uh, in the bottom of the screen. And then, um, during the questions and answers, uh, we uh, I will then read your questions or um, give you the time to uh, to, to say your questions. Uh, we have two presentations today, and the questions and answers will be after each presentation. So, uh, without uh, keeping you uh, waiting anymore, let us start. Um, when we hear the word German, many keywords pop into our head, but most commonly would be technology, innovation, and research. Germany has been the home of many prominent researchers, and in this context, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Thomas Fischer. Dr. Fischer is the deputy head of the Center of Management Research at the German Institute for Textile and Fiber Research in Denkendorf. He deals with Textile 4.0, which is the digitalization of textile value creation and the resulting issues regarding innovation, production, learning, business models, and sustainability. He also focuses on knowledge-based systems, big data, and artificial intelligence, in production and product development. Dr. Fischer studied technical cybernetics at the University of Stuttgart and did his doctorate on the topic of cross-company innovation management. So, Dr. Fischer, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jasmine, for this uh, kind introduction. And I hope the expectation level is not too high because I'm not uh, like Albert Einstein or whatever. So we have a tradition of German uh, researchers and inventors. Um, but of course, we have uh, a lot of people working in university, working in research institutes. Okay, I will try to share my screen. Um, Yasmin, is this the right one? Looks good, Dr. Fischer. Okay, thank you very much. Then we can um, start right away. Um, as already mentioned, um, I'm working for the German Institute of Textiles and Fiber Research, DITF Denkendorf. And I think we are at least Europe's largest textile research institute with about uh, 250, 70 people working every day on new topics of in textile. And textile does not mean only clothing. Textile is everything. On the left picture, you can see our production of carbon fiber, of high performance fibers. Uh, in the middle, you can see um, new technology for non-woven textiles, a new machine we set up together with our partners. And on the right, you see things we do in the digital world. Um, this is a project that is looking at uh, new point of sale uh, scenarios even already before the pandemic because uh, we know that e-business and um, store business will somehow merge there will be scenarios there will be digital models there will be customers using digital devices so this is also something we look at 
just in short, we have about 300 employees. We have uh, half half turnover from public money, from public research projects and from private industry um, orders and uh, projects. We have a lot of space. So we have all the machines in place. We can do everything from the molecule to the carbon fiber up to the final product. And the final product is not only fashion, but also medical textiles, whatever. Um, we provide a lot of services and we have partners all over the world, not only in Germany, not only in Europe, but also we cooperate with other uh, countries. And here are some highlights that uh, look into digitalization. Um, one is that we work for concepts for the digital factory of the future. So, so we, we look at uh, sensors technology, we look at 3D design, we look at uh, modular factory kits, how to, how to uh, bring things together. We look at new um, ways of designing fashion, starting from the scanner and from the digital model of the customers. Uh, and then, for example, we have algorithms that transfer scanned objects, scanned feet, for example, directly to the knitting machine, and we are able to knit something uh, personalized. Uh, we look also at something we call our micro factory, and I will explore this later, where we have a consistent digitalization path from the 3D design to the digital printing on white fabric. We have a lot of technology there, automated cutting, and then we can uh, produce uh, customized fashion, for example. But we also look at sensors, data, and AI solutions. And finally, last but not least, the sustainability is a big issue. We do material flow cost accounting, life cycle analysis, uh, global warming potential analysis for different processes so that you can analyze. And in the end, if you're wearing a shirt or a t-shirt or whatever, ideally you can say this has a CO2 equivalent of 14.5 um, uh, kilograms or something like this. So we really look into the processes and understand where are the, the heavy, processes in terms of energy, in terms of uh, CO2. So digitalization has a, a number of aspects and a number of topics, and I'm, I'm going to look a little bit deeper into uh, four of them today. The first one is digital engineering and, and, and what we call the micro factory. Um, the second one is a little bit on IT, big data, artificial intelligence. I know they have a, there's a lot of things going around that one. Then I will uh, explore a little bit the sustainability issue. And finally, the digital transformation requires also new forms of collaboration and cooperation. Uh, and in the end, also new business models. And I will have a couple of slides on that one. Um, on the digital micro factory, uh, this is something we presented on fairs back in the time when the fairs were still open uh, in 2017, 2019. So we had uh, a number of digital micro factories installations, for example, at Tech Textile Tech Process, the biggest uh, European fair. Um, and you can see a number of videos. I just put in one here, but uh, you can also Google for Tech Textile Digital Textile Micro Factory and uh, you will find us. And this is, this is the blueprint process for, for what we call digital engineering and digital micro factory. And this is a, a new way of producing uh, clothes and, and other articles, not necessarily only for, for mass production, but uh, it's a showcase for how digital design and digital production might work. And we start with the, the cut design, the 3D design. I guess you all know cut systems. You know that there are 3D cut systems as well. And if you look close, you see here also a mannequin, an avatar, or a scanner. And this can be something that is rep representing the average customer you are looking for based on, on, on big data. But this can also be an individual scan of a human person you want to design a dress for. And then you can play around and design everything in terms of color, in terms of shape, in terms of, of design. You can, you can modify the shape so that it's really fitting to this single person. And when everything is in place, you send it to the printer 
And because you have here only the colors you can print in the design space, the printer prints exactly what you want um, with uh, either transfer paper, but also nowadays a lot direct printing on cotton uh, with special inks. Uh, so no need for transfer paper and everything. Um, it's uh, possible on cotton, on polycotton, on all different material mixes. And we print exactly only what we need and what is necessary for this one, one piece. Um, we have a digital integrated automated cutting. So the cutter knows what he has to cut because he gets the same file. And he has a camera and he knows he looks where to, where to start the cutting. And so we have an automated single uh, ply cutting. Um, and then we can assemble and we have one individualized piece. This can be made to measure for premium customers. This can also be very important for rapid prototyping. If you're looking at design, if you're looking at uh, the development of a new collection. So this is a, a very good thing also for rapid prototyping, for playing, for trying out new materials. But if you want to, you can stop here and have a virtual meeting with uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and you can look at the digital collection already in the computer. Um, so this is the, the prototype of what we call the micro factory process or the simulate print and cut process. We stay digital as long as it's possible. We have end-to-end -end engineering from the 3D design to the production. It's completely networked and integrated. Uh, even the, the sewing machine can get the file and knows automatically the settings in terms of uh, thread uh, tension and, and all the other technical fa um, things you can adjust on the sewing machine. Also the sewing machine can get the file and can get the information. Um, the starting point is a body scanner. We have also a body scanner in our lab, of course. Uh, you know that from the airports. Um, and what we can do is we, we scan persons and we can also compare them to the mass measurements because there are size Germany, size Italy, size US, size China, size whatever. There are a lot of people have, having been scanned. We have quality data and you can compare, you can understand my customers fit into this or you can do some statistical analysis and we can use also this one as a starting point for individual product development and there is an automatic extraction of body measurements so if we scan somebody we automatically know uh, what is the belly waist what is the foot length what is the shoulder what is the arm length what is the girth of the uh, arm here what is the girth of the of the upper uh, foot here, so you can get a uh, hundred of body measurements automatically based on the scan. You can automatically extract body parts and whatever. You can do a lot of things with scanned um, data. So if you're looking for individualized and more more fitting to your target group, um, then it's a good idea to to use digital customer data either from the big databases or you can scan representative persons. Um, looking at the computer again, uh, you see here on the right side, uh, just a little bit, this is one of the results from the scanning. Uh, you see, you, get, you can't see the numbers, but you, see, you get a list of all the body measurements. You get, for example, here's the head circumference. So you get all the data. Um, another thing we get data from is the machine directly. So we, we really add sensors to the machines, to the weaving machines, to the knitting machines in order to optimize the production process in order to do something like predictive maintenance so that the machine we can know from the from the data that the machine is waiting for maintenance that the needles are not good anymore that uh, the oiling is is needs some refreshment um, and we can also predict the quality and predict errors because we, we do a long-term analysis. This is one turn of the knitting machine. And if we can do a long-term analysis, we can look into the details of this data. We see some abnormalities, we see some, some jumps. And um, with a lot of uh, AI and statistic analysis, we can, we can kind of conclude a lot of things and feed this back into the um, technical engineering. So we can see that maybe 
the polyester yarn from one supplier does not fit to to the uh, machine process and so we can choose the other one and we can optimize the the supply material to the product we are producing Uh, and this requires a lot of IT and IT investments, and I, I guess you all are aware of this. So this is just an example how our network looks like. And you, if you have a digital lab, you need a, really a network nowadays. So you have the internet, we have the firewall, we have an IIoT, Internet of Industrial Thing network, so that all the, the machines and all the sensors, everything is represented in this network. Um, then we have Raspberry Pis for for um, quick quick uh, and and on the fly sensor integration. We have the big servers. We have the the traditional data um, services. And this is, for example, a, a Bosch sensor. This is uh, well, you can't see it, but it's the number of centimeters includes a lot of things. It it measures the vibration, temperature, and and all the things. And you can, if you have a trained system you can put this on the weaving or on the knitting machine and you can get the data you just seen on the picture before and you can if you have a trained neural network you can understand if the machine is running smooth or not just from from looking at the data these are different sensors here uh, this is raspberry so we, we have uh, yes you need really uh, technical equipment so it, it also has to do with uh, hardware and investment and having the people that know how to do that. Another mega trend is uh, sustainability. Sustainability is really something customers in Europe at least and probably all over the world ask for. They want to be clean, they want to be healthy, they want to have uh, good products that were also produced with socially visible and transparent uh, standards um, and to guarantee sustainability you know already this is um, this is really a challenge and my, my next speaker will will maybe talk about the transparency in, in Egypt cotton how you you prove that transparency and the quality of data is really key to success if the customer has a t-shirt and bought a t-shirt and there's a QR code and he scans the QR code and wants to know everything about the product, the product needs to know everything about itself. It needs to know or it needs to look in a database or in a blockchain, where was the cotton field? Um, who was working with the cotton? Where was the spinning machine? When what was it produced? How much energy was used? Uh, and all this thing, and this is what we call a digital twin or a digital backpack. So the products need to know everything about its its birth and its history, or it needs at least to link to a database or to a blockchain where we can look for that one. And of course, we all know it's really difficult because we, we put in some water on the plants. We, we used energy for spinning. We use energy for weaving. We use all types of different energies. We are weaving uh, hundreds of thousands of meters and how to allocate which energy is allocated on which uh, trouser or shirt or whatever, how much is it? So this is something uh, we really need to look in detail in the processes. And I will show you some, some modeling, what we call material flow cost accounting as an instrument used by manufacturing companies to really improve the material efficiency and to cost calculate the costs and the energy and all the flows um, for the whole process so this is an important element if you want to really operate uh, your resource efficiency and and standardize with the iso norms and what all the other things if you want to be ready for life cycle analysis for for transparency things you really need to look into your processes and understand your processes how does it look like um, we have material and energy flows and we have the costs assigned and we have the CO2 emissions assigned and we can all integrate this to one big model and then we can calculate a lot of scenarios and views to these models. And we can understand, okay, if I buy the cotton in Egypt, um, then it maybe has a little bit more water than the other cot cotton, but it has less transportation. Transportation is, is costly. So overall the, the global warming potential or the CO2 is better with the Egypt cotton. And you can compare all the scenarios. 
this is for example um, for the production in our micro factory one t-shirt um, the t-shirt it starts with the color management i told you that we need to understand the colors of the printer and this is computer so we need a little 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 bit of computer energy here then we do the 3d design and the simulation oh sorry um, design and simulation we also have computer time so we also have electricity here um, if we have the, the file, the final file for the, that controls the production, then this one goes into the printer. And the printer, you now you can see, I'm not sure if you can read it, but anyway, the printer needs um, the paper if we do sublimation. The, it needs ink, it needs personal, it needs uh, depreciation because it's 10 years or whatever. It needs electricity and it needs also the print head. The, um, that has to be replaced every now and then. So these are all the materials that have to be calculated uh, and have to be calculated down to one unit of textile production uh, if we are looking for printing a t-shirt or printing uh, on a fabric. Plus we have a waste stream because we cannot print 100%. That means we have already uh, some part of the of, of waste. Um, then we go to the calendar because we need the, the transfer. Here we have the, the fabric and the transfer. Uh, and here we, we have the paper and here we have the fabric. This one go together. And we have also, you can see the big one because it's a Sankey diagram. You can see the big one here. We have a lot of electricity because it, we have to heat up the thing. Here we have a big waste stream as well because we have to transfer paper that is waste afterwards. Then we go to the cutter. The cutter needs also electricity. Um, it has a waste because we cannot cut everything. We have something, uh, a little bit of, of waste and fabric. And then we go to the confection. The confection needs accessories, buttons and, and threads and everything and electricity. And in the end, we have the textile product. So you see even the production in our micro factory of one t-shirt is, is already a rather complex process. And you can imagine if you look at the big spinning companies, big weaving companies, these process models become a bit more complex. But we have to make them only once because we can use the same, exactly the same model, the same model uh, to calculate the prices because we can assign the costs to all the different resources we use. And then we can understand that the design here costs uh, already something that uh, the color management and computer electricity costs something. Um, then we have the next process. We have we are at three euro ninety nine here already because we we uh, had a lot of costs to to do the printing. Then we have the calendar. We have the fabric. The fabric costs another three euros, so we at seven euro seventy five here. Um, then we have the cutting, and here we have the waste stream. So we we have to waste one euro twenty six um, in in. Um, leftover from the cutting and we have uh, 7 euro 33 then we have the confection we have the personal costs so in the end one t-shirt and of course this is more expensive than, than mass production but it's an example of our micro factory one t-shirt would cost us here 13 euro 25 and of course you can understand that you that you um, have different um, simulations you can calculate a lot of different scenarios. Uh, if I replace the cutter by a smaller cutter, if I add a new confection machine here, if I have whatever I change, I can understand how the things will, will change. And you can use exactly the same model uh, to calculate the CO2 equivalent. Um, so this t-shirt would have an equivalent of 2.66 kilogram CO2. The biggest uh, plus the waste streams, of course, we have to calculate the waste streams as well. And uh, the biggest CO2 comes, of course, from the fabric. So it's already clear that we need a holistic thing. We cannot only look at our process, but we need to look at the spinning process, the weaving process, all the other processes. Because the CO2 is embedded in the product and the CO2 goes from one textile stage to the next textile stage. Um, and each process adds a little bit to the product, but in the end, it is important to have the overall CO2 burden. So this is, 
this is important and this is something uh, we do with companies in Germany, we do with companies in, in, in Europe, and we would like also to do this with other companies to enable them to understand the energy flows, the materials flows, and the global warming potentials. Um, to get an idea, it's of course, it can be 2.67 or 2.66, we cannot calculate on this precision, but we get an idea and we can compare different um, scenarios. We can understand um, if we change our supply chain, if we open new fabric here, if we use solar energy instead of traditional energy in Germany, it's, it's coal. Uh, if we use um, different ways of heat, if you use gas for heat or if we have uh, solar power for heat, uh, what is the effect? And what is the effect on one single t-shirt on one single piece? And this is important to, to get this transparency, to understand um, what the process, uh, processes look like. And finally, the digital transformation requires also a change in the business model, a, cha a change in the way we are working. Um, because as I told you, maybe if you have a micro factory and you do one to uh, individualized products, you first sell the product and then you produce the product. And you can do this already on a number of, uh, of uh, websites in, in Germany or in Europe. You can customize your own shirt. Uh, you can choose a fabric, a given fabric. You can adjust the, the buttons and the, co um, the color and the design of the shirt. Uh, you can adjust this. You can adjust this also to your body measurements. Uh, via internet, via computer, and you click, now I want to have this shirt. And then it's actually in your region, it's either Northern Africa or Turkey or Romania or Eastern Europe, one of these factories that are collected to the service. This file pops up and then the company there knows, okay, now we have to produce this one shirt for this one customers. And of course you have to know that this is the shirt for this customer. So you have to label it, you have to put a code on it and then you have to package it. And within one week or 10 days, the customer in Germany has his individualized shirts, shirt with his, uh, the selected fabric, this fabric was on stock, but it was cut individually. It was sewed individually, the right buttons, the right colors, the right accessories were added on. And the customer in Germany pays 59 or 69 or 49 euros for this individualized shirts, shirt um, that was produced only for him. And of course, this requires a change in the business model. And if you want to differentiate yourself and you want to offer new services, then this is the path that you, you need to rethink your business model. What am I doing? Am I producing really 1 million shirts and trying to sell them afterwards? Or do I offer services like that? Do I participate in, in sharing economy? Do I uh, open my factory for designer and makers uh, in terms of a makerspace? Do I open uh, for communities? Do I uh, participate in what we call open innovation or customer co-creation? Um, do I produce lot size one? This is one extreme, of course, that I have individual products for everybody. Um, do the customers pay for that? How is the revenue model? And, and all that thing. And this is something that is also changing the mindset of the people because it's not the traditional way of working in a factory. Okay, I get my orders, 100 orders a day. I have to produce them in the most efficient way. Maybe it's difficult. Maybe it gets different uh, in the future. And we had a lot of projects also in the European context. You see here the map of one. Uh, we were looking at Italy because Italy has a strong tradition in uh, in working in textiles, but also in, the, in, the, in some of the eastern parts. Portugal is a strong competitor of Arabian countries, I guess. And uh, we were looking at different scenarios for the future and we realized that uh, we came up with five different ones. And one would be that we have interconnected local regional supply chains because nearshoring regional production is one big thing in Europe. Uh, a lot of people in Europe don't want to buy from far, far east, knowing that their product has been traveling three times all around the world. They want to have sustainable regional produced things. 
On the opposite, some people want really global networked value creation because it's cheap, it's fast, it's, uh, it's fast fashion. Uh, that is another scenario that will probably be in uh, one element of the future. Another one is hybrid products and service providers so that um, we have a, a network and we ask people, okay, um, maybe it's better to rent a jeans and there are some websites you can rent jeans and not buy jeans. Maybe it's better to rent the jeans and then the, the service is different. They send me a new jeans every three months and they collect the old jeans and we have a circular economy because they use the old jeans to make new jeans again. And we have recycling processes. Uh, so we need additional factories. We need additional processes to collect and to prepare and then to recycle all the materials. This is another aspect. Um, uh, circular economy that also requires again the tracing and the information in the product so the the product does not only need to know where was I produced and what was the, the uh, cotton farm I was growing but also how can I be recycled so that the recycling companies know how the recycling of the product has to take place. Um, another scenario would be this open manufacturing and open innovation where people can come in. We have the young designer teams from university in the big cities and they offer their services in maker labs and uh, people can come in and bring their picture and say, okay, I want to have a, a t-shirt or a shirt or a dress with this picture. And we can include the body scanning thing and, and all that thing that is uh, people who want to pay a little bit and want to participate in, in the design of their product and want to understand how their product is uh, developed. This would end up really in a made to measure product where we have really the consumer driven value creation. The consumer says, I want to have something and then we need a network of service providers. Uh, okay, who can produce this one for me? And this is a different, different way of thinking and a different way of doing business. And of course it's a niche, but it's a growing niche in, 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 in Europe, we guess. And uh, especially um, companies that are close to Europe that uh, offer the nearshoring and the regional production, uh, I think have chances also on these scenarios. So what are the key messages? Um, the digital transformation cannot be stopped, I guess. So also the mass production makes, makes use of digital transformation. Uh, it cannot be stopped and sustainability will be the major driver in the future. And digitalization comprises uh, many different aspects. Um, we have the scanning of the materials, we have the scanning of the human bodies that all goes into this digital engineering. So we can really simulate already on the computer, how does it look like? How is the weaving? How is the knitting? Does it fit to this body? We have digital integrated processes, as I showed you, um, from the computer, we send the file to the printer, we send the file to the cutter, we send the information to the sewing machines. Sensors and data will enable machine learning, artificial intelligence, and therefore predictive quality and predictive maintenance. So that the product knows, okay, today um, the polyester I made of is a little bit less uh, durable than the one uh, than normally. So the process needs a little bit of adjustment. Um, sustainability is, is key factor and we need to understand it really along the supply chain. I, I showed you one of the models and the big models for the big supply chains. It's really something you, you could start. Um, this is important to, to analyze the sustainability really along the complete sup uh, supply chain. The digitalization requires new business models and new ways of thinking and maybe also new supply chain concepts. And one of the major drivers is also the, the retail, the shopping. Uh, I added you two pictures of a project we did with Brux. Brux is a German company. Um, they use digital models for virtual product development. So the global team of Brux meets in a virtual room and discusses, okay, this is the new trouser, it's, it's fitting, but we need, maybe the shirts does not fit to the trouser or whatever, and they work on the thing. 
and uh, also in the, at the point of sale it might be possible that in some shops you can try on the jeans and virtually try on the fitting t-shirt and or you can change the color or you can you can do a lot of things in in the modern shopping centers so the point of sale and the shopping via internet and in the shop will somehow match and will somehow be digitalized could be also the scenario that you scan yourself with your mobile phone if you do virtual shopping or e-commerce e and then get a selection of fitting products that are that exactly fit for you and the critical success factors is the change of mindset really become digital go to the young people ask the young people include them into the companies uh, have a change management that you really transform your company in a digital company choose the right people choose the right mentality um, and then you can really manage the change towards digital and sustainable future. So thank you very much for listening to me. And we believe the future is textile, not only in clothing, also in medical and technical, in a lot of building textiles. We have a lot of applications for textile. The future is definitely textile. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fischer. This was uh, a very, very interesting uh, presentation um, for me personally as well. And um, I would like to open the floor for any questions from uh, our dear participants. If uh, any of you uh, has a question uh, or a topic uh, they wish to discuss, please go ahead, don't be shy and uh, ask your question. One comment just on my on the picture. You see in the background the lamp, and then that's a globe. I put it as a lamp, and it changes the perspective uh, and your view on the world because the north becomes the south, and you can see things from a different perspective. And sometimes it's a good idea to change the perspective. I totally agree. I actually wanted to ask you about it, <laughs> first of all, because I think it's a very innovative and a uh, nice uh, way to use the globe yeah. and um, you're right it's it's all about changing the perspective because uh, nowadays and this is i think the if i can, may call it obstacle of this digital transformation and all of this is just changing the concept and the view of uh, the point of view of people how they look at the Recycling, sustainability, changing the business model, changing, um, going out of what they are used to mm -hmm. and exploring other options. So changing perspective would be great. I'm checking the, okay, and uh, I see a hand risen from Martina. It's Please. mine, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Dr. Fischer, thank you very much. Uh, if you could highlight again, maybe a little bit, if we look at the so traditional supply chain yes. as it was about 10, 15, 20 years ago, what, who would you say will be the typical losers in this supply chain and who will be the winners if we transfer it to, uh, well, we don't know what's ahead, but maybe in the near future. So we're still in the beginning of the whole transformation stage, right? Well, if you, I, <laughs> the, the magic bowl, so to say. <laughs> it's difficult to say, but I think the, the winners will definitely be the ones that embrace the change early. And of course, it's always this thing between exploitation and exploration. You cannot close your factory and say, I want to do everything new and digital now. But you have to be open and you have to really understand the whole supply chains and understand where are your customers moving and where are your suppliers moving and what are the new opportunities? Where can I find my new niche? We have in Europe, we have companies that are uh, offering services for, for fabrics, basically. They don't sell thousands of meters of fabrics anymore, but they say, okay, send me a picture, send me an idea, send me something. We can do a print, we can do weaving, we can do whatever. Uh, I offer you as a service, five meters, 50 meters, 500 meters, whatever. So it's, it's a different business model. They, do, they don't produce on stock anymore, but they produce on demand, for example. And, 
this is something you need to understand and understand really how are young people buying fashion, what are their demands, what, what are their needs and how you can integrate the way they playfully work with their phones and with the digital technology. But it's difficult to predict winners and losers, but uh, uh, of course you don't need to shut down if you have a running textile factory, but you can maybe think, how can I digitize a bit? How can I add some sensors? How can I monitor my processes a bit better? How can I understand my processes a bit better? How can I offer the service that I say, okay, this product has a CO2 or global warming potential of something? How can I trace back the things and how can I offer some information about my product? Thank Perfect. you. Mm. Uh, we have another question from yes. uh, Ms. Marwa. Uh, she says, do you think this transformation is easy for SMEs and affordable? And what are the first steps needed for that? So it's two parts of the question. Nothing is easy in a global and very competitive environment. It's, it's really nothing is easy, but if it's SME, SMEs are more flexible. But sometimes it depends if they have the financial uh, power to, to really go for the change. But nothing is easy. Really take your time, sit down and understand the whole system, the whole supply chain. And try to picture the new, uh, new, new ways of working, new supply chains and understand where, where, is, where, where, uh, where is everything going. It's everything that can be digitized will be digitized. And digitization is, uh, if you remember 50 years ago, there were, there were uh, tapes and music and, and records. And then there was the CD and everybody said, okay, now we have digital. We have the CD is digital. And now we, have don't, we don't have anything at all. We have just have Spotify. So this was the second part of digitization. And of course in clothing, it will, won't be that one. But uh, anyway, maybe we have, a lot of uh, recycling and second hand and, and there will be much less producing but much more repairing and refurbishing or whatever if you look at companies like patagonia they they offer lifelong repair services for the products they they sell so it's maybe less about production but more about repair and uh, refurbish or recycle who knows Thank you, Dr. Fischer, and thank you, Ms. Marwa, for your uh, question. Um, do we have any more questions? Uh, uh, one more, if I may. <laughs> um, would you, because we are right today discussing it also in an Egyptian environment, uh, would you say that uh, Egypt would still count as a nearshoring destination uh, from a European perspective? Yes. I guess so, yes, because uh, there's no very little cotton growing in, in, in Europe. So this is definitely near showing in terms of cotton. And, and, and of course, I understand that a lot of African companies and Northern African companies nowadays, they want to integrate. They want not only to sell the cotton because this is one part only of the value chain, but also uh, open some spinning companies, some weaving companies. So I think this is near showing. And I told you the shirts that are produced they call it our greater Europe, basically. So it's either, yeah, Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania, this is Europe and, and uh, Tunisia or Egypt or whatever is, is almost Europe. Um, and, and this is something that is working in, in this business model. And within one week, you have it at the customer again. Okay, thank you, Sophie. Thank you so much. Uh... I do not see any questions in the chat, nor do I see any risen hands. So, uh, Dr. Fisher, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you all for your contributions and questions. And um, as Dr. Fisher just said now, uh, uh, that Tunisia and Egypt are almost Europe, uh, let us move south all over the Mediterranean, all across the Mediterranean to my home country, Egypt, and uh, have an overview of uh, its plans to 
have and plan and integrate and build the textile industry 4.0. And uh, what would be better than uh, hearing about this through someone who has uh, hands-on experience on that matter. This is why it gives me great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Mr. Haniel Habibi. Uh, Mr. Al Habibi has a deep knowledge of the Egyptian and international textile industry, having been actively involved in the sector since 1993. He is a member of the Textile Institute UK, an Egypt section manager of the textile industry, member of the Industry Advisory Board, Fashion Institute of New York, board member of the Egyptian Textile Development Association and former head of textile committee and board member in the Egyptian Junior Businessmen Association. Mr. Habibi is the chairman of the Sahara Group, a textile specialized marketing service provider. They contributed in the establishment of the Egyptian cotton trademark and created the EGTEX digital portal, a portal um, specialized in sourcing B2B trades and fairs, Egyptian cotton home textile online uh, B2C brand as well. Mr. Habibi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Yasmin. I'll just uh, share the screen. Uh, now, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Fisher for the uh, nice uh, introduction about the development of uh, uh, textile 4.0 and 3D printing and how it can support product development. But uh, I, I, on my side, I will try to go more on a macro side, uh, discussing how, how this sector is uh, uh, built uh, in Egypt uh, from the commercial side, exports and side and on a regional side, uh, when we speak about the Mediterranean uh, region. Now, when, it, when we look at the Mediterranean region, we can see that uh, the main suppliers now in, uh, of textile products and the home textile and garments is mainly Turkey. Uh, Turkey is a vertically integrated uh, industry. They have they grow cotton, they have spinning, weaving, dyeing and finishing and uh, uh, sewing facilities. Uh, which makes them the largest supplier in the Mediterranean region to the European uh, market. While we have the, the southern Mediterranean countries such as Morocco and Tunisia, they're more into the confection part uh, and supplying ready-made garments and home textile products that are imported from uh, outside Tunisia and Morocco. Uh, whilst Egypt uh, has uh, the advantage of Egyptian cotton as we will see during the presentation, and has a vertically integrated industry very similar to Turkey. Now, the, the textile supply chain has moved from uh, in Europe. We only can find now textile producers in Italy and Spain and Portugal. Uh, Europe now is more spe specialized, as uh, we've seen in the last session, uh, more into technical textile distribution, uh, retail business, and branding. Uh, the, the, the main manufacturing side of the whole supply chain has moved uh, to the southern Mediterranean, Turkey, and we will not forget that we are, we are competing now with large-scale manufacturing facilities in India, China, Bangladesh. Now, if we look at the, generally the global value chain, we can see that the, the, the current consumption per capita is around 12 kilograms, where, where, where we find developing developed countries uh, per capita consumption uh, goes as high as 34 kilograms per capita annually in the US, Germany 24, Japan 21. While uh, it's expected by 2050 that it reach on an average of 16 kilograms per capita. Now the main reason for this is of course the increase for the population growth and the income growth, especially in developing countries, uh, which will, that will affect the average uh, uh, consumption per capita. Currently, Egypt's fiber consumption, we're talking about four kilograms per capita. Uh, now, of course, the Egyptian population is around 104 million now, expected in the next few years to reach 109. And we, we have a major advantage in Egypt that 50% of the population is uh, uh, with the age of less than 25. Uh, now, with the growth of the population and with the increase forecasted in the income growth, 
we expect the per capita consumption in Egypt to reach seven kilograms per capita in 25. Now, when we look at the global uh, value chain consumption of uh, fibers, we're talking around 100 million tons of fiber consumption. Uh, around 70% are man-made uh, fibers, of which polyester represents a large portion of it. Uh, and cotton is around 25 uh, million uh, tons uh, of annual consumption. The largest producers worldwide of cotton is India, US, Pakistan, while we have uh, within the, the, the 25 million consumption of cotton, we have only 2% related to extra long fiber. And this is what we're going to go a bit deeper uh, into. 2% of the world's uh, cotton production is extra long uh, fibers. And uh, we're expecting a decline in the world consumption of cotton due to the continuous increase in uh, man-made fiber consumption. Now, if we, we have a closer look on a macro level on the textile industry in Egypt, we're talking about an industry that represents 30% of the total industrial workforce. We're talking about large public sector companies, around 32, that are currently being merged into uh, nine public sector companies, and more than 2,500 uh, private sector uh, textile companies that are spread throughout the supply chain. The value of the output is estimated at 12 billion US dollars. We're talking about an investment of $8 billion and representing 10% of the total exports of Egypt, including oil exports. It represents a big portion of the Egypt national GDP, around 4%. And the major advantage that Egypt has, that has a, a very, uh, let's say, uh, comparative advantages related to the trade agreements. We have the Euromed EU free trade agreement. We have the QIZ with the US market. Uh, we have the COMESA covering the African countries. We have as well the Arab uh, uh, countries regional free trade agreement, as well as the accum accumulation of origin related with the Agadir uh, agreement, which uh, involves Jordan, Tunisia, and Morocco. And this is one of the big advantages in the Agadir that fabrics from Egypt can go to Tunisia and Morocco, then exported to the, the EU. Now, when we were talking about the vertical integration of the industry with Egypt here, we, we, we have Egyptian cotton, but we import man-made fibers. We import short staple cotton, mostly from uh, Greece and Sudan, uh, as well as covering the local consumption through this vertical, vertical integration of the industry. Uh, we export Egyptian cotton. We, we export yarn fabrics, and as well as apparel and home textile, which we'll see in the very uh, few slides coming up. But we, we need to look at the labor. The labor is, is a major uh, part in the textile sector in general. And uh, we, we have a, an advantage within even the Mediterranean region that we have a lower cost of labor compared to developed countries. We, we can see that Turkey, the cost of labor per hour is five and a half dollars, while it goes less in Tunisia to three dollars, uh, and Morocco uh, as well. And we, we can see that China, the cost of labor in China is increasing as it reached now 2.6. Uh, dollars per hour. Egypt is one of the, uh, the, the lowest uh, countries worldwide in the cost of labor. It's around one dollar per hour. Uh, despite that, there is a major issue it's, uh, we, when we compare the cost of, of labor. We need to look as well as on the productivity and efficiency. And uh, in order to improve that, we need to be able to measure the, the performance in real time uh, in order and, and match this with the income uh, generated to the, the labor. Now, Egypt is famous with Egyptian cotton. It's, it's a, a world known uh, brand name. If, we, if, we, if you go in the streets in London, New York, uh, Tokyo, uh, in Milan, and you pick up any consumer in the street, and you, you tell them about Egyptian cotton, they, they have a certain perspective. It's high quality, very expensive, luxurious product that can be seen in bed sheets terry towels, t-shirts, uh, and shirts. But it has a very strong uh, brand uh, within the consumer perception. And that's why we find uh, most of the luxurious brands worldwide, if you go into any retail shop, the Egyptian cotton prices, uh, consumer prices, are considerably high compared to other types of cotton products. Now, Egyptian cotton as a fiber was introduced in plantation in Egypt uh, more than 200 years ago. And uh, the, the big advantage that Egypt has uh, related to Egyptian cotton, that the seeds uh, or the copyrights of the seeds 
are uh, owned by the Cotton Research Institute. And it's a very long process to have one variety of uh, Egyptian cotton. It takes from 10 to 15 years to de de develop any variety. The, the, the ones in yellow are the current commercial uh, varieties that cover the, the yarn counts. Uh, for people who are not familiar with textile, uh, yarn count is the uh, process which is after uh, the fiber. It's spinning. And uh, uh, in yarn, the, the, it, the counts range from uh, low as six up to 180 uh, or even 260. Now, what's uh, the advantage of Egyptian cotton? That is one of the few fibers uh, that can go up and uh, spin uh, yarn counts above uh, 60. So it goes from 60 up to, up to 260, which makes very fine uh, fabrics uh, that cannot be made from any other type of, of cotton. Now, this, in, th in this slide, this is the, around 20 years ago, uh, Egypt created uh, a logo, let's say, that represents the brand of Egyptian cotton that is currently managed by the Egyptian Cotton Egypt Association. And this brand is owned by the Ministry of Trade and the Industry and the, the, the Cotton Exporters Federation, Alcotexa. And currently, most of the retailers uh, in the US, in Europe, uh, uh, and brands, they recognize that this logo uh, is very important to protect any fraud that happens. Because sometimes we find manufacturers that uh, label it Egyptian cotton to take advantage of the price premium. Uh, <clears throat> but this logo saves uh, this uh, fraud and um, uh, misception of uh, consumer uh, rights. And we, ha we, ha we have noticed that three, four years ago, th there was a big scandal in, in the US uh, from manufacturers in India that uh, have used uh, labeling of Egyptian cotton. Uh, and, and it has been uh, known through using the logo and testing the DNA of the final product in the retail. This is one of the projects that Egypt has uh, supported, that uh, Egypt now can uh, test final product as a t-shirt, bed linen, uh, or towel, and make sure it is 100% uh, made from Egyptian cotton. Now, if we, we go into statistics, Egypt uh, around 15 years ago was the, the, the largest producer of extra long staple cotton, which represents around 2% of the world's uh, production. We were presenting 40% of the extra long staple, despite its decline, but uh, we're back again, uh, representing 20% in the last season. And we're expected uh, in the next five years plan that Egypt plantation will increase dramatically to absorb the investments that are currently happening in the primary textiles, which has been spinning and weaving in the textile value chain in Egypt. This shows the Egypt textile trade balance. Uh, for, and now, if you're not familiar, this is it's by HS codes, which is the HS codes that represents the, the textile supply chain. And uh, in the first half of the screen are Egypt imports, and in the second half, Egypt exports. Now, from there, we can see that the total imports of Egypt in, in the last year, in 2020, was around $3 billion, uh, while exports is around only $2.7 uh, billion. So actually, we have a negative trade balance in the textile sector. We import uh, uh, more than we export. And this is one of the, the, the let's say, the potential part of uh, supporting the textile sector is to have a positive textile trade balance. If we look at other countries uh, in the region or worldwide, uh, this is these figures until 2019. We can see as here that Egypt negative trade balance, uh, we, we, our imports represent 134% of our exports. While we look at Tunisia, that uh, mainly concentrates on the confection part or the making up part, which is uh, the last part of the uh, textile uh, supply chain in the manufacturing. Uh, they, they, their imports represent 57% of their exports. When we look at Turkey, we see that uh, Turkey, uh, their imports represent 36% of their uh, exports, while Bangladesh, India, and China the lowest going to 12%. So there is big potential in, in, in supporting the Egyptian textile industry through uh, investment. Now, this is how it was in the past. And, and I'll give an example uh, on, a, on a very small scale. In the past, when, we, when big, large textile companies having 25,000, 30,000 employees, they were paying salaries, they were uh, having employees carrying boxes of money 
actual cash money going around in, in all the factory units and paying in cash. Now we're talking about something different. We're talking about through digitalization and uh, having uh, ATM cards. Uh, this is not there anymore. Uh, we're talking about how to measure productivity. In the past, it was all paperwork, uh, punch cards, planning. Now we're talking about uh, a totally different uh, concept. And this brings us to the information age, where uh, we, we need to have real-time information gathered from data from uh, uh, different devices and components in order to have real-time information to measure the, the performance uh, and to integrate with different players in the textile supply chain. This provided that information is power. Once you have information, you'll be able to have a, a very strong competitive edge uh, and you'll be able to grow the business dramatically uh, because you'll be able to find uh, ways to uh, locate and the, where are the weak points in the organization or on, on, a, on a country, uh, if we're going to look at the textile sector. And from there, actions can be taken based on real-time uh, information. Now, when we talk about Industry 4.0, the most important thing is that it's, it's, it's a set of technologies that help in, in integration of the product design, distribution, uh, and communicating devices, technologies, and uh, together. Now, we are no longer looking at uh, subsequent uh, phases. We're looking at integrated flow of information through digital technology. There are five pillars uh, to the Industry 4.0. We, the, the, the main one is speed in order to reduce time to innovation and short product development. And Dr. Fisher has explained that uh, uh, very, uh, in a very detailed uh, manner that with the 3D printing and product development, uh, we, we can come up with a sample much faster than, uh, than we do it in the traditional way. We'll be able to, to reach to produce quality products through decreasing the waste uh, and monitoring production uh, and uh, evaluating productivity and efficiency. Having the ability to, to have flexibility in order to have mass customization. And we can see this, uh, this uh, uh, for example, in, in trials, we've seen that uh, you can now, uh, through uh, uh, going to a retail uh, shop, and, and you can choose how you want a shirt to be made, how you want the collar to be uh, uh, made, how you want to have your initials through embroidery on the cuffs. This is uh, mass customization, and, and therefore the production uh, uh, has to adapt to this mass customization uh, demand. Security is a, is a major pillar. Uh, in order to avoid any uh, inactivity period uh, of interaction of all these technologies together and cyber attacks. And here, the, 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 main, the main part, the fifth part is uh, productivity. Now, when we talk about 4.0, we're talking about integration of the cyber physical system, Internet of Things, ERPs, uh, MES, manufacturing execution system, uh, product management, supply chain, and business intelligence. When we look at the Internet of Things, is, is, is how to use technology into Internet to, to integrate devices together. And uh, a very good example on the textile supply chain, when we talk about machinery, how to integrate the machinery with the machine suppliers in order to do on-time uh, maintenance and to check the machine if they need any spare parts uh, in order to avoid any stoppage uh, time of production. Now, all this is done uh, through uh, platforms on the internet and it's directly connected with the, the machine suppliers. Now, the ERP is a major part in any organization, and this is when we're talking about uh, not an, an industry level, that it, it helps to connect the different parts of, of the organization from human resources, finance, uh, sales and marketing, uh, management of uh, 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 stocks, uh, warehousing, uh, payments, uh, and uh, purchasing. And these are examples of how it can support each of these uh, uh, functions within an organization of human resources, in the material resource uh, planning, in the purchasing, in the sales. Uh, and, but we, when we apply the, the ERP, we need to understand the supply chain of the textile sector. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very large supply chain 
It includes spinning, weaving, knitting, dyeing, finishing, making up, until embroidery and uh, confection, as well as uh, stocks, uh, handling, and integrating with the, uh, the retail market, the brand, and the consumer. This is a, a, another visual of how the supply chain it starts with cotton, then the ginning part where we extract the seeds uh, from the cotton, then the spinning, yarn dyeing. We can have uh, yarn dyed, then, then after that, the weaving, the making up, and the retail. Now, here, here we, we can see how we can integrate the 4.0 into the supply chain. Uh, within each uh, subsector in the supply chain, there are sensors on the machine. There are uh, we, where you can track uh, the productivity per machine, uh, as well as handling the, the management part through the ERP system of the operation and the, the management uh, throughout the spinning, weaving, confection, until we reach even the, the consumer side. Uh, and this is because now, as we're talking about sustainability, as per uh, Dr. Fisher was mentioning, and so the, the consumer now is more uh, focused on, 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 on the sustainability and from where this product that he's spending money to buy, wh where is the source of the product? Where is the source of the fiber produced, uh, uh, used in, in, in this product? And, and, and if we don't have uh, uh, digitalization throughout the textile supply chain, it will be difficult to, to fulfill the, the, the demand of the consumer. Uh, despite that it might look difficult now, uh, 10 years ago, uh, it would, we wouldn't have imagined that we would be able to track and trace uh, the fibers uh, in, the, in the products sold uh, in the retail market. Now, to, to, to monitor the, the manufacturing side, uh, already suppliers of machinery have created and established uh, softwares that, that can be monitoring the, their, their production and productivity in, uh, on their machines and uh, to have direct contact with them in order to inform them about the performance of the machines, as I mentioned earlier. And this happens throughout the supply chain. We have in the spinning it's an example essential, uh, in weaving just tweet software, in dyeing and finishing. And each of these softwares they, they, besides integrating with the machine suppliers, they provide to the organization a very detailed uh, uh, spreadsheet and information about uh, the, the daily production to help the, to do in the planning of the production uh, and uh, to help to support the supply chain of, uh, of the organization. Now, when we talk about Egyptian cotton, a, a pillar part is developing the Egyptian cotton traceability. And this should start from the seeds being distributed from the farmer uh, to the farmer for plantation. And then we will be able to identify these seeds, uh, to which farmer has uh, used them uh, on, on a card that, that will be digitalized, where he will uh, uh, put in the information in this card that shows how much cotton he has produced uh, from these seeds and, how, and then Tags are being to be put on the bags given to the farmers that where they collect their uh, cotton. Uh, then they're going to be turned, uh, tracking these bags when they turn into bales after the ginning process. And the tracking continues throughout the spinning, weaving, knitting, uh, and confection supply chain up to the final consumer. Now, it's very important that brands and, and retailers, if they're able to trace uh, the Egyptian cotton uh, uh, supply chain, it will enable uh, Egypt to create a blockchain for Egyptian cotton, uh, where, where the consumer, once he buys uh, a product off the shelf uh, in any of the retail uh, outlets in, uh, in Europe or the US, he, he will be able to identify immediately in real time where this cotton has been grown, in which area in Egypt, who has made the, the yarn, fabrics, dyeing, and the confection of the product he's buying, which is a huge added value for the, a customer who is willing to pay a premium for the, the product he is buying, and he wants to make sure that his, his product is genuine. Now, the, the governmental side is very important to support uh, Building Egypt Textile 4.0. Uh, the, the, we have here different ministries that affect different parts of the textile supply chain. Uh, and uh, 
from all these messages, we, we, it's very important to create digital platforms to, in, uh, integ to enable the integration uh, between the, the organizations in the textile value chain and supply chain in Egypt with the different institutions uh, to support building Egypt Textile 4.0. Uh, the, the last part of the presentation is related to a platform that has been uh, done around 20 years ago. Uh, uh, this platform, with the objective of integrating information to technology into the textile companies uh, in Egypt, regardless of their current level of technological infrastructure or uh, proficiency. Now, when, when this started 20 years ago, uh, we, we found that uh, the majority of the manufacturers in Egypt don't have emails. Uh, and then uh, it, it was a major uh, a challenge at that time. Uh, but gr gradually during the time, we found that the, most of the traffic coming to the platform comes from outside Egypt for people who want to integrate and source uh, products from Egypt, wants to sell products to Egypt. But it, it became a, a gateway for the textile industry it's a very strong tool that other countries in the region as well, in Tunisia, Morocco, Turkey, Europe, can create platforms for their textile uh, supply chain. And uh, throughout these platforms, we can integrate and create B2B business and networking between manufacturers within uh, the Mediterranean region. Uh, it provides information, researches, news, prices, and it, it creates uh, a platform uh, to integrate even manufacturers within the Egypt textile uh, supply chain. Uh, when we look at the, the, the platform, this is how it started in 2001. It was very static. Uh, at that time, it was using HTML, to whom was familiar with the development part. Then it went to, into uh, dot, uh, ASP.NET. Then recently, it, uh, it went to PHP. And uh, now we're, we're launching the, the latest version after uh, doing some design and uh, uh, new development to integrate more into other platforms within the Egypt textile value chain. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Hany, for this uh, very uh, insightful presentation. And uh, I'm also really looking forward to seeing um, Egypt transform its uh, textile industry into industry 4.0. Let's be hopeful and uh, look out for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if any of you has, has any question, would like to discuss anything. Also, if you're uncomfortable writing in English and you would like to write your question in Arabic, uh, I'd gladly translate it. Um, and I see a hand. Martina, please, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I, I have a lot of questions, actually. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hani, for the excellent presentation. Um, I want to start with two questions. Uh, so one was you were showing a slide showing that 30% uh, showing that of the Egyptian workforce is currently somehow related to the textile industry. Um, so the question is, what's going to happen to these people in the future? Because I was thinking of the slide that Dr. Fisher was showing was like a fully automated production process where you probably have some techies at the end and some techies at the beginning, but in between there's hardly any labor involved anymore. Uh, which leads to the second question. You were indicating the cost of labor, which is very, uh, um, has a very, as a competitive advantage. Do you think in the future this will still be a relevant factor or isn't it rather the, the pool of tech talents that you will have uh, in the industry? So those would be my two questions. Thank you. Let me start from the, the cost of labor. Now, I think cost of labor will, will keep being a major part uh, uh, in, the, in the pricing and the costing within the textile uh, supply chain. But uh, I would emphasize that we, we should look at productivity uh, and efficiency alongside uh, the cost, actual cost paid to uh, workers. Uh, and, and this is one of the major deficiencies uh, in Egypt, that we have lower productivity compared to other countries. Uh, and this improved uh, through uh, training, of course. But the, the most important thing is how to measure 
in real time the productivity of labor uh, and how to link this with the payments uh, given to labor. Uh, as we've seen that Egypt, uh, we pay $1 uh, around uh, on average. Uh, we can pay more, but it, we, we have to be able to measure this productivity and efficiency. Uh, now, on the, on, the, on the first part related to the creation of jobs, of course it will affect the, the, the creation of the, let's say, uh, normal or standard jobs, especially in uh, parts of the supply chain that can be automated. Uh, for example, in, in, in the spinning, which is the first uh, cycle in the textile value chain, we can see now machines operated by less number of uh, labor, uh, with very much higher uh, productivity uh, per minute and per hour. But we, we have, we've created other jobs uh, as well in other parts of the textile uh, value chain. Uh, but the, the effect, of course, yes, but there will be other jobs as well created, especially when, when, we, when we talk now about the distribution part that will be created uh, and uh, integrating with uh, international uh, retailers uh, in Europe and the US. Thank you, Mr. Gates. Martina, uh, I hope uh, this answers your questions. Uh, do you have any further ones? Uh, I have one more, if I may, un unless there's someone else. <laughs> so um, you were also mentioning, so I think there's still um, a lot of companies or state companies that are active in the, in the textile industry. So I was thinking, do you see that they can, I think it's called leapfrog, uh, you know, when we look at the future or, or where, where do you see them? What is their potential? Thank you. The, the, the current situation in the public companies, they, they, they represent a, page, a major share um, in the primary textile part of the supply chain. When we talk about in the beginning of cotton, around 75% uh, is the market share of public companies. In spinning, it's around spinning and weaving, it's around 50 percent. And uh, during the past uh, two years, Egypt, the uh, public sector, we started a very ambitious plan with investments exceeding 1 billion uh, euros in buying uh, the highest technology machines from European suppliers uh, in spinning, weaving, dyeing, and finishing. Not only to increase uh, and support Egypt exports, but to support the private sector that need primary textile for them. Uh, when we look at the private sector involvement in textile value chain, we can see that the major concentration is, uh, is in the confection part, the garment making, the home textile uh, sewing. Uh, and these public sector companies, they will provide, the, let's say, the raw materials uh, like yarn and fabrics to increase the competitiveness uh, of Egypt's private sector. Uh, I think the plan is that uh, the, all this production will, will uh, increase Egypt consumption of Egyptian cotton, because the focus from all this technology is to uh, take advantage of the raw material, which is Egyptian cotton, uh, and turn it into a competitive uh, advantage uh, in the textile uh, trade balance of Egypt, uh, and supply uh, local uh, manufacturers from the private sector. Uh, and I, I think production will start by the end of the 2022, full production of uh, this large in investment uh, that has been uh, already signed and uh, it's, uh, progressing with the, doing now uh, the buildings and the infrastructure, uh, which is expecting to, to increase the consumption of Egypt from Egyptian cotton from a slow level of 10,000 tons per year now to around uh, 80,000 tons uh, after three years from now. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. I have a, a comment and a question from Ms. Maro Abdul Sawed. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, is this your kind vision for the industry in Egypt, or is uh, or this is really achieved? I, I, it's not my personal vision. I think it's a country vision. We can see that the president of Egypt has uh, mentioned that. Uh, uh, Egypt has to transform within uh, the next 10 years uh, into digitalization. And I think ma major investment has been done into the IT infrastructure, uh, despite uh, currently that uh, uh, our uh, brand uh, width on the internet is very low, 26 megabytes per second. 
uh, compared to other African countries, but Egypt is committed to do uh, around more than $16 billion of investment to uh, uh, improve Egypt's ranking uh, on the IT uh, infrastructure, and as well as other ministries and institutions we've seen now, uh, there is the digital invoices uh, being uh, applied throughout the, the largest uh, companies in Egypt. They have became uh, integrating into the Ministry of Finance uh, portals. Uh, and uh, there are lots of transformations happening. Uh, but I, I predict in the next two years, we'll see a big difference uh, because it, it's a will of a country to turn Egypt into a digital uh, and supporting digital transformation. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, because I believe this is an ambitious plan, and I, I hope, I hope it will be implemented soon. It will be great to have something like that in this in textile industry. Thank you so much for your side. Better successful. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay, so uh, I don't see any other questions, and I don't. Maybe one one comment. Yes, please. Now, I just wanted to add that uh, yes, I was showing the micro factory, but of course, it's not that this will be the standard production process for everybody. Just showing to, I was just showing what is possible in the future and what might be one of the niches, but I'm sure we will have still factories with people working there, but they need to have more competences in terms of digitalization. They need to understand data. They need uh, different types of training. So this is also something uh, we will have the young techies uh, um, working in, in textile and textile when the fashion business has to become a bit more sexy, a bit more attractive also to young people. Um, so thank you also, um, Mr. Habibi. It was very interesting also to see the, the Egypt uh, cotton initiative. And, and I think all these topics and tracing and tracking and, and everything, this was very well fitting to, to my thoughts. So um, thank you for that one also. You're welcome, Dr. Fisher. Thank you very much. So um, I would also like to thank you all again. Thank you, Mr. Haney. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Um, special thanks to you, Martina, for your support. And also a very big thank you for all our participants for your engagement and your time. Um, I was very happy to uh, be in uh, this uh, very informative and insightful session and uh, wish you all um, a great day. And um, whoever is interested, then please join our next um, Rakameya sessions that start uh, in a while. And- um, Yes, mean we can't hear you. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> All of this, you didn't hear any of this? <laughs> okay, again, uh, I would like to thank uh, you all. Thank you, Mr. Haney. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Thank you, Martina. Special thanks to you and to all our participants for their engagement and time. And, and I, uh, I hope um, to see you. I mean, I hope you have a great day and make sure if you're interested in the other, uh, our Rahame 